Amen. And thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd. We shall not want that you do lead us besides good, still, nourishing waters. We thank you for all of your grace and your kindness through the week. Thank you that you've led us, you've been with us, you've watched over us, kept us. And we hear this morning just to thank you, praise you, lift up your name. We don't come with an agenda. We don't come trying to get anything out of you. But we want to set aside this time to just say thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. the
Well, shall we just close our eyes and pray? And pray, Lord, as we've sung, it's all about you. And that's why we pray this morning that you would take all your glory. As we turn to your word, we pray that you'd bless it. Bless it to our hearts and our minds. And may your name be truly honored and glorified through this time of worship together. We pray and ask this for your name's sake. Amen. Well, I'm thankful for another opportunity that I can share with you my subject or topic for this morning's message is temptation, believe it or not. Not a very common topic these days in church, not an easy topic either, something I think we all tend to want to run away from, (laughs) but it's actually something that's with us every day of our lives. If you're living for the Lord, the devil is definitely not happy, and he tries every day to try and tempt us or test us, as some people say. And I'd like to say it in this way. He tries every day to try and deviate us from our aim and our goal and our purpose in serving the Lord. And he tries to do that through temptation. I think we would almost always rather talk about love and joy and fellowship and all those nice things and never want to face temptation. And yet, that's the the way of an overcoming Christian, is to face temptation square in its face and deal with it. So I'd like to start with the Oxford Dictionary explanation of temptation. Just what does it mean for a start, before we even get to the spiritual side? And the dictionary says temptation is the desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. If that can sink into your head a little bit. The desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. And I think they've hit the nail on the head. Although it's not a spiritual explanation, it's just the Oxford Dictionary, what they say. But they've hit the nail on the head because that's exactly what the devil tries to do when he tempts us. He tries to lure us into temptation. And he tries to arouse that desire to do something wrong or something unwise. And in so doing, he puts us off the track. That's his aim. He wants to throw us off the track. He wants us to lose our goal, lose our aim in serving God, and just detour us a little bit. Now, we've got to remember that temptation is not sin. As strong as the temptation can be sometimes, and that it almost feels sometimes like you are sinning. You know, the power 
or the pull of the temptation can make you feel like you've sinned or actually make you feel guilty because it comes so close to your spiritual life that you almost feel dirty or besmirched by this temptation, you know. And you almost want to say to yourself, well, how can the devil have such audacity to bring that at me or to throw that at me? But if you haven't given in, if you haven't succumbed, you have not sinned. No matter how strong the power of that temptation is, as long as you resist, you have not sinned. It remains pure temptation and only temptation. We are always called to obey the Lord, and the test is temptation. That's another way of looking at temptation. It's a kind of testing our resistance against disobedience. That's how you can test your obedience. How resistant are you to disobedience? And that will prove your obedience to God. Our resistance to temptation is a sign of our obedience to God. If you've ever thought of it in that way. So like we've said, obedience to God is simply maintaining, if you want to put it in an easy, simple, everyday language, it's simply maintaining your focus at all times. In other words, don't take your eyes off Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on him. And no matter what temptation comes your way, if your eyes are fixed on him, you will always be obedient to him and you'll be able to resist the temptation. Because all he wants to do, remember the devil is a defeated enemy, eh? Is a defeated foe. All he wants to do is very cunning, very clever. All he wants to do is deter you from your focus, deflect your thoughts from whatever you want to do, where your thoughts are laid up on God and the things of God. He wants to deflect you from that. And he wants to just bump you or push you off the track. That's his uh, aim and his purpose. And, or sometimes he wants to just make you close one eye. Just, you know, temptation can be just a little bit of compromise sometimes. And then he's got you. You know what they say? Give him a, a little finger and he'll take the whole hand. That's all he's up to. If you can only be aware and awake to that. He has no power. He's just a trickster. That's all he is. And he wants to deceive you and I through temptation. And if you become, or if you are, just a go-along, everyday, Sunday Christian, and you have that mediocre Christian life, happy to go to church on a Sunday and do whatever you like from Monday to Friday, doesn't really matter as long as I'm back in church on Sunday, then he's going to catch you, He's going to deceive you. He's going to throw you off the track because your eyes are not fixed on him every day. Or shall we say, all the time. And that's what he wants. He doesn't tell you that he's going to throw you into hell or you'd keep miles away from him if he told you that. said, come here. I want to throw you into hell. You'll run away. He comes so cunningly, so cleverly, And just tries to give you a little brush off the side. Push you off the road. And then he's got you. So, as an example of how to resist temptation, what better example can we have than Jesus himself? So let's just start reading Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1. My Bible is titled, that chapter is titled, Satan Tempts Jesus in the Wilderness. And then verse 1 and 2, let's start there. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. 
to be tempted there by the devil. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Now, I don't believe that this portion was recorded in the Bible to show us how good the Lord is, how strong he is, how powerful he is, and how he can conquer the devil. That's maybe one side of it, one part of it. But I do want to believe that this has been recorded as an example for us. He used himself, you know, God became man. He's a human being, just like you and I, with flesh and blood, feelings. He got hungry, he got tired. And he recorded this as an example for you and I to have when we face temptation. In other words, he wants to show us how it's done. So number one, it's possible. And then how it is possible. And so, he was led by the Spirit. I found that quite interesting. I don't know if you've ever read this before. He never fell into temptation, didn't make a mistake or be overcome by his weaknesses. He was led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, it was God's will that he be tempted. And that's why I said he was tempted for our sakes, to show us and to teach us. And we can be tempted every day of our lives. And we are tempted every day of our lives. As you sit here, you can be tempted not to listen. The devil will come with his little voice and he'll say, do you know how many light bulbs are in this, in this church? Have you ever counted them? And he's taken you completely off the track. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> you don't hear anymore. And then when you're having coffee, you say to your friend, hey, that was a beautiful service, wasn't it? <laughs> and you hardly heard half of it. You were counting all the light bulbs and what time the load shedding's going to kick in. <laughs> Then we, then we get over that hurdle. <laughs> of course, that's what he does. And it was as if God was saying, test my son. Test my son. Because he will show you how to do it. Remember in the book of Job, Job chapter 1, Job came when everyone was around, and God actually said to Job, uh, uh, sorry, not to Job, to the devil. He actually said to the devil, he said, Devil, have you tried my servant Job? It's part of life, temptation. God's going to allow it, even though the devil does it. God's going to allow it, and we have to overcome it. We have to pass that test. You know, Job was far from all of us. God said of Job, there's no one on earth like him, blameless, upright, who fears God and shuns evil. So now go and test him. That's what God was saying. Imagine a testimony like that. Imagine if God could say that about you and I. He's upright, blameless, he shuns evil, and you can even go and test him. Go and try him out. I know. He'll stand on my side. And we all know what Job went through and how he ended. Job would never let anything obstruct his vision or his focus. Nothing. He lost everything. He was prepared to give it all up. Nothing would cause him to go astray. And I think that's why sometimes God allows us to be tempted, just to test our faith and to see if we can stand by our word in what we've said that we're going to follow him. Now, it's also interesting to see the time frame when this took place. If you read the previous chapter, chapter Matthew chapter 3, 
It was the time when the Lord was baptized. He was beginning to prepare for his ministry. And an amazing thing happened. Something that's never, ever happened on earth before. As, he, as John baptized him, God's voice sounded from heaven on high and came down and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He was accepted. He was acknowledged for everyone to see before God. This is my son, and he is pleasing to me. In other words, he is ready now for the ministry that I have ordained for him. And you know what? The devil hears that. That's why he was on the, on the Lord's heels. The next moment, he was there ready to tempt the Lord. And when the God acknowledges us or prepares us or confirms us for any part of his ministry, whether it's preaching, whether it's in the kitchen, in your office, in the school, wherever your ministry is where God has put you, the devil can hear that. And he knows that. And let me dare say he's coming for you. But just remember who he is and who you are. You might not have an ordained ministry to go to China or to the Ukraine. You might be just in your little workshop. That's your ministry. That's where God has put you. And he's ordained you. But make no mistake. The devil is coming to try and unseat that ministry with his deception. He will try and knock you off focus. So, <clears throat> how does he come now? I'd like to put it in this way. He's got three levels of temptation or three categories, we can say. Or maybe you can even call them three layers of temptation. And the one is found in verse 4 and 5. No, sorry. Did I skip something? Or jump something? Oh, yes, the first one is... Um, from verse 3 and 4, sorry, not 4 and 5, 3 and 4. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that first level or first category is always an attack or an attempt on our emotions, our feelings, on the lusts of the flesh. You can imagine how Jesus felt. Hungry, tired, sunburnt. His emotions were very low. His feelings were low. And he was vulnerable to the flesh, to his emotions. It was very easy to tempt him, if one can say it like that. You know how it is when you're tired or you're hungry. And uh, it's so easy just, just to give in to hunger, thirst, and tiredness. It's so easy to do something wrong or do something unwise that will fulfill that desire that the devil rouses up in you. So easy to give in because you're not at full strength. You're not in your full power. And the devil comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, 
And I think when I look at it, I think he tried to have a dig at his feelings. He tried to hurt his feelings. You know, when somebody um, accuses you of something, how it can hurt your feelings, you feel wounded, or you be falsely accused of something, you feel wounded, and then you feel like you can hit back. You can strike back. That's the wrong impression you got of me. And I want to tell you how it is. And I think that's why the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, because he had just been approved for everyone to see, acknowledged by God himself, the voice came out of heaven. This is my son of God. This is my son. So he is the son of God. And here the devil says to him, just show us now, you know. Show us who you are, what you can do, how great you are. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. In other words, just do it. Man. Show us, prove it, prove us, prove to us who you are. Just do it. And he made it so easy for him to give in to the flesh and to lose his focus and lose his goal and water down his ministry. What was his goal? What did he come to earth for? Why was he born? And why did he die? To save us. And the devil was trying to knock that off the track. If you are the son of God, just show us your power. Show us what you can do. And that's what the devil sometimes comes to us and says, just do it, man. Just, just do it. Don't worry. Close an eye. Do it. It was like Esau and Jacob in Genesis chapter 25. Esau came in tired from the field, working hard. And there was Jacob in the kitchen making a nice soup. And he said, just give me something to eat. Give me your soup. And Jacob, uh, Esau, sorry, fell for it. Jacob said, okay, I'll give you soup. Give me your birthright. And he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Wasn't attentive, aware of the focus that he should have. Where he was going, what was his goal? He just gave in to his emotions, his feelings. Gave in to his flesh and succumbed to the temptation and took something to eat. But what did the Lord Jesus do? And that's what he wants to teach us. He never displayed his power. He never said, devil, don't you know who I am? Weren't you there? I'm the son of God. Do you know what I can do? And what I've come here for? What does the Lord do? He answers him with the word of God. Remember, the word of God is God. The word became flesh. The word of God is God. And that is our most powerful tool that we have against the devil. The word of God. No praying on handkerchiefs, no holy oil, no piece of the crucifix <laughs> is ever more powerful than the word of God. That's how we can overcome the devil. And that's why I said this is a lesson, an example that the Lord set before us in how to conquer temptation or overcome temptation. He gave him exactly what God, God's word says. He quoted from the book of Deuteronomy and said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He refused to give in to his human wants or needs. He refused to use his supernatural power, but he chose to obey his father and do his father's will to the end. 
And that's a picture of true focus. Absolutely nothing of himself he wanted. Or to show anything of how good he was or who he was. But he chose to obey the Father's will. Because that's what he came for. That's why he was born. And his vision, his eyes were fixed on the way to the cross. That's what the Father had sent him to do. And nothing was going to deter him from that. He refused to be tempted otherwise. Just something small on the uh, power of the word. You know, in communist countries, some time back, uh, a Bible was outlawed. They would write Bible verses on scraps of paper and hide them, and keep them among themselves. And there was this one ho home where the woman... A woman, a certain woman, used to have a prayer meeting and she had a Bible. And she was the only one, I think, in that whole area that had a Bible. And she made <clears throat> a plastic, it was a small little tattered Bible, a plastic bag where she would put this Bible in. And of course, when they had their prayer meetings, they would always have a guard standing outside because the KGB or whoever they were, would always come around to check up and see who the Christians are and what are they doing. And if there was a Bible, it would be immediately confiscated and uh, destroyed. And she, when the word came, they're here, the cops are here, she would put this Bible in the plastic bag and she'd always have a pot of soup on the stove for after the prayer meeting. And she'd put the plastic bag in the soup and put the lid on. And they would come because they knew, you know, they always had spies. They knew this woman has got a Bible. They've told us about her. And they would search and search and turn the place upside down. And they'd have to go away because they would open the pot and see the soup and close it and didn't notice the Bible that was under cooking under the soup there. And that just shows us the power of the Word of God that they fought so hard that people should not have the Word of God because they knew if they had the Word of God, it would be powerful and that would, that would, would keep them. Then, <clears throat> if he can't get your emotions or your feelings, he moves to the next level or to the next layer, which is the intellectual level the level of our head, our thinking, our logic, our reasoning. He's a clever old chap, don't forget. Eh? And then in verse 5 and 6, he says that, uh, it says, The devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you. Another version says, for it is written. Just look at the old chap, how clever he is. The Lord Jesus defends the temptation with the word of God. And what's his next step? He comes with the very word of God. He says, hey Lord, Jesus, it's written. The scriptures say. Just look at him. And that's how he can come to us again when he can't get us in one layer, one category. Then he comes to the intellect, to the knowledge. And he says, you know, the scriptures say this and that. I'm not making it up. I'm not coming to you with my own stories, trying to catch you. The scriptures say, this is what the word says. Doesn't it remind you of Adam and Eve. They were precisely told what not to do by God himself, given an instruction. Eat and be free of everything in the garden except this one tree in the middle. And God specifically says, you can read it for yourself, Genesis chapter 3 says, but do not 
eat the fruit of this tree, for you will surely die. Can you be more direct than that? And when the devil came to Eve, she told him exactly what God had said. She didn't change the wording. She didn't to suit herself or anything like that. She said, no, devil. God said, we should not eat it. And if we do, we will die. And what did the devil say to her? He didn't argue with her. He didn't say, that's not the word of God. That's not what God said. That's not how God said it. He just put a little bit, an iota of doubt into her mind. You see, that's when he comes to the intellect, to our knowledge. And he said to her, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Did God really say that? He just started to make her doubt. Did God really say that? And it started to turn in Eve's mind. Did, God, did I hear right? All of a sudden now she knew exactly what God had told her. But now the devil says to her, did he really say that? And she starts to think, did he really? Did I hear right? Was I standing in the right place? Was there a breeze that day? And I missed a word or two or something. And she starts to doubt. I listened to a radio talk show not so long ago. And the topic was, of course, you know, the popular topic of today, same-sex marriage. And they had a guy there, they're interviewing this guy, and he was giving all the positive things about why there's nothing wrong with this. It can go on and we must be tolerant and all the rest of it. And then they opened the lines. People could phone in. And of course, there was a Christian listening and he phoned in and he said, you know, according to the Bible, God does not allow that. A man is a man and a woman is a, mo a woman created by God. And then the, the, the host of the program, at the end of the program, he was closing up. He said, but you know, can we be offended by love. Who are we to judge somebody if they're in love? And who are we to qualify love? Love is love. And if two people love each other, well then who are we to say anything against it? It's love. And I thought, you know, the many people listening can just be won over by that. Because the devil can take that and use it as doubt in your mind. In other words, actually, who, who am I, you know, to condemn someone else? I'm not God. Who am I to, to judge you now? You know, it's actually, it's, it's love, you know, that you're showing for each other. And that's what the devil does. He just takes, tries to take God's word, God's principles, God's norms, and his values, and he just turns it a little bit. And he says, like he said to Eve, did God really say that? Do you think it is? actually means this or that or yes or no or don't or do and you know today everything is relative to who you are and what you believe but what does God say that's what you and I have got to answer to those are our principles those are our values those are our norms and make sure whatever they are whatever faith you belong to whatever God you believe in. Make sure that it's the God of the Bible and that whatever you believe in is based on what the Bible says. 
because he's going to come. If he can't get you in the flesh, he's going to come to your intellect, to your reasoning, to your mind. And he's going to sow some doubt there and cause you to go astray and off the track and lose your focus. And then number three, the third layer of temptation, verse 8. Next, the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. And then the Lord rebukes him and says, get out of here, Satan. And tells him that the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and him only. Now he tries to jab at the heart. That's the third level. Because he wanted the Lord to bow down and serve him. You know, that was Satan's problem from the beginning. He wanted to be worshipped. That's why he was kicked out of heaven. He wanted to be God. And since that day, he's trying to drag each and every one of us onto his level, down to his level. He tried it with Eve and he got it right. And he tries it with us and we can only get out of it through the salvation and redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came and died to cause that to be null. But that's what he tried to do eventually. He tried to make the Lord bow down before him. He, in other words, he said, give me your heart now. I can't get you in all these other ways. Give me your heart. I want, I want your heart. And he's, he does it now. He's, he, he's run out of tact, actually. And that's where we must get the devil to. That's the point we must drive him to, where he's got no words anymore. He's got, he can't say, do this, do that, and the scripture says, and all the rest of it anymore. He just tells a big, fat lie. And he says, you see, all this is all mine. Just bow down and I'll give it all to you. I'll give everything to you. Whatever you want, just bow down. In other words, I just want to sit on the throne of your heart. Give me that place. And the Lord Jesus has got no more words for him either. Not even scripture is worth spending on him. He just says to him, away with you, Satan. Forget about it. Stop your nonsense. Get out of here. Vamos. Pack up and go. Get out of here, Satan. That's what the Bible says. You are a liar. Because everything that you have has been given to you, and it won't be for long. It's going to be, the day is coming when it's going to be taken away from you, and you yourself will be destroyed. Nothing belongs to you. Puts him in his place, and that's where we should all put the devil in his place because he's a conquered enemy doesn't it remind you of uh, the story of david king david and bathsheba king david's heart was in the wrong place the devil captured him got it right through temptation to get hold of his heart his heart was entirely in the wrong place it had slipped it had fallen but then Uriah, the soldier, he was a man whose heart was in the right place. David sent him home. He said, Uriah, go home. Sleep in your comfortable bed. Spend the night at home. And you can go back and fight. Join the army tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning, where did David find him? Sleeping at the gate in the guardhouse. On the floor, probably. And David said, I sent food for you. What are you still doing here? And what did Uriah say? Can you see that heart that's fixed on God? Focused? What did Uriah say? My Lord, how can I sleep in my comfortable bed when my brothers are hard at battle, day and night, fighting for the kingdom? And here am I, 
I'd rather sleep at the gate and experience a little bit of that discomfort, that hardship, that I can bond with them somehow. His heart was where God wanted it to be. And the devil wanted the Lord Jesus to bow down and give him his heart, which was an impossibility. And that's why he had no more words for him. He said, devil, just get, get going. Just get out of here. Don't waste your time anymore. Get, get going. I don't want to see you anymore. And uh, dear friends, that's where our hearts should be. And I've tried to paint a picture of resistance against temptation, which is a great lesson to me, a wonderful lesson to me, and that's why I thought I'll pass it on and share it with you. And I hope and I trust that you've gained something from it and that your eyes will be fixed on the Lord no matter what the temptation. And in closing, <clears throat> I'd like to read uh, 1 Corinthians 10. You all know that uh, verse. No temptation has taken hold of you such that is common to man. You know that one so well. But I read it in the Amplified Version. And it really stood out for me. And I'd like to read the Amplified Version for you. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 13, in closing. It says, No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. Nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. I think you need to underline that. As weak and as almost overcome as you feel sometimes, remember God will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. And we all have our own level of ability. We all have our own personalities. <clears throat> but along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. Amen. Thank you. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. And we pray that it has uplifted us, given us ammunition in our pouches to go out in this new week that we face and face the devil, face the temptation, and overcome in your glory and in your power. We pray and ask this trusting in your name. Amen.